Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll see a profile of our very own news director here at Prairie Public, Dave Thompson. But first, joining me now is a political science professor from North Dakota State University, Nick Baroth. Nick, thanks so much for joining well, us Well, thank today. you for having me here this uh, cold February <laughs> morning. I'm glad to be here. Well, as we get started, first tell a little, the folks a little bit about yourself. All right. Well, I'm um, Nick Barris, professor of political science. Uh, I focus on local and state politics at NDSU. Um, I'm originally from Western Pennsylvania, but don't hold that against me. I've been here since, oh, 2004. So hopefully I know a thing or two by now. Now, what got you interested in political science? Oh, my goodness, that's a long story, because um, I lived in Seattle at one point, and while I was there, I worked for a neighborhood newspaper, and I watched the city starting to transform. And, well, just watching how the city council, the uh, county commission were involved in my neighborhood, I just got curious, and from there on, I was, well, hooked on politics, I suppose. Well, with that said, we're, let, let's start with a, a national question. Mm -hmm. Where do you see uh, the political landscape as we kind of, or we're kind of going into the midterm 2018 mm -hmm. elections? So where do you see our political landscape in the country? Boy, this is going to be a, an interesting season, as always, to watch. Um, right now, if you were just doing your straightforward political science sort of thing, you would expect this would be a good year for the Democrats. You know, it's a midterm election. You have a Republican president, Republican control of Congress. And so um, all the signs would be that it's going the uh, Democrats' way, just historically. But if you're looking in our day and age, there are some people say maybe it will be a wave election. Maybe it will be a year that the Democrats don't just win a few seats here and there. Maybe they'll um, flip the House, flip the Senate. And then there's other people who say, well, you know, that could happen, but it's a long ways to go. And uh, Donald Trump and his pull on his supporters, in particular in the Republican Party, that's going to be tougher to overcome than you might expect. So we're, as everyone else, political scientists are well reading the tea leaves, trying to get a sense of where things are headed right now. Sure. Uh, seems to be an interesting time, as, mm -hmm. as you say. But So let's talk about the state. Obviously, Kevin Kramer has now entered yes. the race for uh, U.S. Senate. Uh, can you talk about why he decided to run against Heidi Heidkamp? Boy, um, there's a couple reasons I can think of. Is First of all, um, she is a vulnerable senator. This is a state that Donald Trump won big, and uh, when Heidi Heitkamp won her election, it was just by the skin of her teeth. So just heading into this election in a normal time, so I suppose, you would say, all right, if you're a Republican Party, you would aim for that. And so if you're an ambitious Republican and you think you have your act together, well, stepping up higher on the big stage is the way to go. Um, the other thing that I think is going on as well is that, well, Kramer had originally said that he wasn't going to run. He was going to run for the, uh, his House seat again. Uh, you had several Republicans step up that say that they were going to run. None of them seemed to be really catching fire. I mean, they seemed to be perfectly fine people and everything, but they didn't seem to be building their profile in a way that they needed to do to overcome a very well-known figure, known figure as uh, Heidi Heitkamp. And so you would suspect that, well, maybe somebody's been whispering in his ear, Kramer's ear, and of course he's been talking with Trump, and saying that, well, if you run, we'll have a lot of money backing you up by the party, by outside groups and such. And if you don't, state Republicans, well, that money's not going to be there. We're not going to put all our time and effort on a candidate who hasn't proven themselves. And so that's sort of the dynamic I think is going on here, because it seemed as if uh, Kramer originally was fairly happy with his seat, was fairly prominent as far as it goes for North Dakota, and it seems like he was going to stay there. So uh, his entering the race, well, while may make things uncomfortable for himself, is going to create a well, a real clash of the titans. I mean, it's not clear who's going to have the upper hand um, for quite a bit of time. The polling's not going on just yet in the state. Um, but if you're looking at it from both perspectives, you know, at the end of the day, I could easily see either one winning this election um, by a small margin, but could still come and uh, win in the end. So it should be, you know, an election like North Dakota's um, not seen, uh, I think, ever. Um, you have a lot of outside groups on Democrat and Republican side who are going to come in, give money to, directly to candidates, set up political organizations, and spend a whole lot of money like we've never be, seen before. I mean, when I say Clash of the Titans, I think there's going to be collateral damage. There's going to be, in terms of the political system, we're going to hear a lot of negative stuff, a lot of um, 
well stories and ads and such that are going to make you think poorly about politics in the long run. So mm -hmm. I guess it's time to sort of uh, sort of gear up and get ready. This is going to be uh, a real ride. Well, you say the Republicans will pour money into this, but what about the Democrats? Will they not do a lot to hang on to this seat? They will. Um, Heidi Heitkamp's good at raising money for her own campaign, um, and you're going to get a lot of people outside of the state giving money to it and um, a lot of people setting up their own uh, groups to spend directly and such. So I expect it should be fairly even when it comes to money being spent. Um, there might be more money coming from North Dakota to Kramer, or there might not be, but I think both sides are going to be depending on their money from outside of the state. So money won't be the issue, it doesn't sound like. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you really handicap the race? Because uh, they both have yeah. uh, voting history. Mm -hmm. So how do you handicap this race? Well, that is a good question, and it's uh, it's going to really come, I think, to a lot of the margins. You know, can you, can you get the job done? Are you competent enough to get out the vote, not make a mistake, and really sort of um, use your resources effectively? I mean, you know, uh, right now I would sort of say it's a you know a toss up. I wouldn't say it's uh, leans Heidi Heitkamp's in a Republican state, but she is the incumbent, and over time she's been she's proven to be popular. She's gotten elected uh, repeatedly statewide. And, Kramer, so does the same way. So, um, you know, in terms of who's winning, I mean, who will win, it's tough to say. But if I was, you know, a cold-blooded political scientist, I would say that the fact that Donald Trump won this state by such a large margin um, would sort of say, well, this is probably a state that at least should be leaning Republican with an election like this. Mm -hmm. You alluded to a close race the last time she mm -hmm. ran. She was running against a uh, a uh, U.S. congressman uh, who stepped into the Senate race, mm -hmm. she'll be doing that again. So will her will her strategy be similar, do you think? Or? Well, um, I think it will be in, in some ways that she's probably not going to do anything that's going to offend the voters, at least in terms of policy, is what I would expect. Um, I think if you're trying to win in the state, one of the, in your Heidi Heitkamp, first of all, you want to have a good image of yourself, not be seen as controversial, but try to draw contrast, you know, that this is, you know, a steady person versus somebody who might not be, you know, you know, whether that's fair or not, of course, is irrelevant here. And I think the first time around, she, she made that contrast pretty well. Um, I think Kramer might be a better candidate, I think, in this sort of close race than Berg. But boy, the devil's going to be in the details, and it's going to be a, a national uh, attention that nationally is going to be focused on it. And so, you know, we'll see who can take the heat, I suppose, to mix my metaphors. No, you're right. It, it will be an interesting race mm -hmm. to follow. Well, with, with the Senate race now set, how do you see the U.S. House race uh, now in, in North mm -hmm. Dakota? That's, um, that's almost like a sideline in some ways, but it seems as if, you know, I mean, to me, it's somebody watching outside, but within the parties, um, it seems on the Republican side, there's a little bit of a musical chairs sort of thing, like, okay, I'm not going to run for the Senate, I'll run for the House, and, you know, there's going to be a shifting around for that. On the Democrat side, again, this is a Republican state, the um, uh, Trump did well here, and all that sort of story, but I think the Democrats can probably do better than the last time around, you know, if that's some sort of consolation. I think they can make it competitive. They can get a good candidate. It seems as if they, um, there's some more enthusiasm with the Democrats on the candidates that are coming up. Uh, whether that translates into a winning margin, well, that's hard to see, but it's not impossible. I mean, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's been a strange couple years, and seeing Democratic victories in Congress in North Dakota, well, I guess that'd be the cherry on top of the cake. Okay. Well, let's go away from the state for a little while, mm -hmm. probably come back to that. Let's talk about uh, nationally. Democrats have won uh, mm -hmm. some races in various states, as you, as you just mentioned. D does that seem to give uh, Democrats optimism that they can at least take back the Senate, do you think? Well, it does. The problem is, is that there's so many seats that are in the Senate that are like North Dakota. I think there's like six or eight, at least, where the uh, Republicans or uh, Donald Trump won big and they took that state. And so usually if you're looking at it and you're saying, all right, we just had an election and the president won it, it's going to be tough for any incumbent Democrat to keep that uh, to keep seat for themselves. And the margin for the pathway for winning the Senate for the uh, Democrats is pretty narrow. Um, it helped that they won in Alabama, but to win in North Dakota, Missouri, Indiana, and these other states is going to be really hard. And if you, you have to run the table in order to win the Senate. And so if they lose one or two, as we might expect, or even more, um, then that sort of takes back all the work that they did in Alabama and these other places. So I mean, it's possible that Democrats could win the Senate, but boy, they have the odds uh, stacked against them in terms of just doing the old eye test. Mm -hmm. What do you make of uh, the incumbent Republicans who are deciding not to run again? 
Well, that's not a good sign for the Republicans, certainly. And it's also a bad sign that it seems as if the Democrats, even in seats that they normally weren't competitive in, uh, were able to get quality challengers, people who have won before at state or local level or have um, access to some sort of fundraising skills and such. And so um, if I was to be a betting man and saying, well, which is more likely for the Democrats to win the House and the Senate, I would say it's probably the, uh, the House. I mean, even though uh, even there it'd be more difficult. Uh, a lot of it, of course, you know, we have odd things going on. Pennsylvania's uh, redistricting districting map has been thrown out, and a new one might be put in place that's a little bit more uh, friendly to the Democrats. And those little marginal things that you don't talk about maybe in other states can make a difference, one, one victory or two victories for the Democrats here and there. So, um, you know, it's if the Democrats are really thinking they can take over one of the uh, chambers, the House seems to be the easiest one to do because in the Senate they got to keep all these difficult seats that they already have and then on top of it win a couple more so that they have a uh, 51 vote margin to to win any ties. So uh, you know Democrats it's possible but boy they got to have some breaks go their way and so far they seem to have but well we'll see what goes on in the future because there's a lot of things going on that's going to be mixed in including the economy including the fact that well people are getting might be getting used to uh, Donald Trump as president and, you know, the fact that the polls seem to be shifting in, in sort of subtle ways that are, well, not necessarily um, uh, horrible for the Republicans, you know, which I can go into detail at some point. Mm -hmm. Well, y you talk about if, if, let's just say, if the Democrats take the Senate mm -hmm. uh, and the House, uh, let's just say if, uh, uh, do you anticipate a constitutional crisis sort of between uh, Congress and, and Trump? It could, yeah. it could well be. Um, I'm not anticipating that there'll be an impeachment process, there'll be talk of it, but it's, that's a really hard thing to do. But just the regular functions of government where Congress provides oversight, um, you know, brings people in, passes laws, uh, maybe sort of, uh, you know, collects evidence that can be used to, for prosecu you know, prosecutions, that sort of stuff, it's a lot more likely to happen with the Democrats in control of either the House and the Senate than otherwise. Um, so. Um, if there's a constitutional crisis, I think it would arise out of that, you know, some sort of oversight, some sort of a refusal to follow what's been passed by the House and Senate. Um, that's probably where it's more going to happen. Again, an impeachment process is so difficult to do, and while it might appeal to a base supporters, to actually get it done and, uh, you know, get your uh, votes in the Senate is really, really difficult divisive to say the least and uh, last time around I remember the Clinton years uh, worked out to Bill Clinton's uh, advantage and the Democrats advantage that time around and the same thing you know if you really push for it could happen here. Mm -hmm. what, where do you think and we're going to talk now about Mueller's mm -hmm. Russian investigation where is it where do you think it will go and what, what that will mean? Boy, that's the, the you know the sixty thousand dollar question you know because it seems as if he's certainly collecting uh, information. He's certainly presenting evidence that certain actors have done uh, bad things and such. And you know, with the, the uh, with some of the subpoenas and the indictments that were released having to do with the uh, the Russian trolls, as they were calling them, um, that's an indication that there's some smoke, there's some substance to these accusations. Um, but tying it to um, the Trump administration, to, to higher level people in terms of that some direct policy, some sort of direct, well, should we say collusions going on? Well, there's a high, there, if you're going to make an extraordinary claim, you've got to have extraordinary proof. You've got to have some sort of evidence that really makes the connection. And so at, it hasn't come out yet. There's a lot of very interesting stuff, a lot of stuff that seems to imply that mid-level staff, some people are doing stuff that, well, might have been dubious to say the least, but tying it in some sort of constitutional crisis. Uh, Mueller's got a ways to go before that. Um, the thing to note is that these sort of um, uh, sort of investigations can take years and years. I mean, again, I remember the Clinton administration where you had Whitewater, and that just went on for years after the administration was done. And so the fact that the uh, Mueller investigations released these information, these indictments, and so forth, in terms of these investigations, means that they're kind of moving at the speed of light. They're actually moving quite quickly in terms of uh, politics and such. So um, between now and the uh, election, well, I think we'll have probably a much better sense if this is going to be just, you know, uh, something that's a, a truly, you know, a constitutional crisis or something, you know, less drastic than that, which could still be quite bad. Mm -hmm. Well, considering uh, we have a fairly strong economy uh, recently, mm -hmm. it, I guess it started to rebound during President Obama's second uh, term and obviously President Trump's first year, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's done well. 
Uh, wouldn't you think Trump's approval ratings would be higher if he uh, maybe tweeted less and uh, didn't say some of the questionable things he's, he's said over his first year? I, I think there's something to that. Um, the thing to note, though, is that uh, Donald Trump's polls had been down in the, the mid-30% approval range, which are really bad for a president under any circumstances. And they've risen up to, you know, the low 40s, which doesn't sound like a big deal. Um, but what it sort of means when you look closer at the polls is that Republican voters and supporters are kind of embracing him now. You know, before his approval amongst Republicans were down around 80, maybe even below 80, which sounds good, but it's not. Usually you expect the partisans to support you 90% or more. It's starting to move that way. And so um, the, uh, the, the really low ratings, the historically low ratings, might be a thing of a pass if he sort of keeps up that love amongst Republicans. Now, whether that's enough to keep the Democrats from taking a House and Senate uh, in the fall is the big question, but it gives them a little bit more um, support. It gives them a little bit more um, sense that maybe Republican voters will come out in, in good margins as well. Maybe this won't be just Democrats who are energized and show up. Maybe uh, the true believers with Donald Trump and other Republicans will show up and mitigate any sort of wave or any sort of uh, bounce back that the Democrats might have. So the, the um, uh, polls are really interesting to watch because, as you mentioned, typically you would expect, yeah, the Democrats wouldn't love a Republican president as much, but they might give them sort of a little bit of a lure, a little bit more of a leeway, you know, all right, not so bad, the economy's doing well. The polls for the Democrats, have, or dem people identify as Democrats, have stayed very low for uh, Donald Trump. There's not been much of a shift over. So it's sort of, um, again, we're, you know, you, we talk about a polarized uh, electorate, and you know, the fact that the, uh, Donald Trump's becoming more uh, popular, at least in the polls, it might actually be a sense that we're becoming even more polarized, that there's you know, love, hate for Donald Trump, and then that's it. And how that translates into North Dakota and the other states, well, that's, the, again, the big question. And political science, you know, in terms of case study, this is going to be quite fascinating. Mm. Midterms, uh, midterm elections sometimes aren't that interesting to watch in, in the off years mm -hmm. of, of a non-presidential. So, but this year is going to be different. I expect so. And, of course, a lot of people say, well, you know, presidential elections, that's a really the sexy election. The midterm ones, eh, not so much. And I think that that's going to still be around. You'll get lower voter turnouts than you would for presidential election. But um, at least we've been led to believe by some polls that a lot of Democrats are motivated to show up and vote. And until recently, it seemed as if Republicans were less so, which is why that maybe the support for him going up might mitigate a wave election to just being, you know, the standard um, midterm election where uh, the party of the president loses some seats here and there. Okay. Well, let's turn our attention back to, to North Dakota. Mm -hmm. uh, some other races that uh, you're sort of keeping your eye on. What about Secretary of State? Is this one that the Democrats have an opportunity to win? Yes, they do, I think, because, um, well, first of all, uh, the incumbent Yeager's been there for a long time. And so it could be that people will say, hey, maybe it's time to move on, maybe try something else. We'll see. Um, uh, but Josh Bushka, uh, uh, the Democrat, um, he, well, he seems to at least to be fairly well known, seems to be able to be somebody who can, uh, has his political act together and is able to raise money and seems to be, you know, out there in front. You know, one of the things that's uh, been interesting about uh, North Dakota elections is that oftentimes uh, it seems like the Democrats have put people in place that mm, seem adequate and then you just don't hear anything. You don't see, and we're living in Fargo where they would seem to be doing better, but you wouldn't hear a whole lot. It seems to be as if either the money's not there or the skills aren't there or who knows what. And it could be, at least with a couple of these statewide elections, the Secretary of State in particular, I'm watching, um, the Democrats could have a, 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 could be quite competitive, and who knows, could even win. Um, but that's the state of the Democratic Party in North Dakota, is that, you know, to say that you're, you have a shot at winning one statewide election and maybe keeping one uh, incumbency, and that would be a successful year. Well, that's, that's a little bit weak tea. That's sort of a little bit of a disappointment if you're trying to be an opposition party in this uh, age of uh, Donald Trump. Okay. How about Attorney General? Is Wayne Stingham a lock to win? Well, I mean, as we were talking about beforehand, he seemed to be somebody who had a pretty good shot at being governor, and that didn't happen. And so, um, you know, and so at this early stage, I would say that he, he doesn't have a lock. You know, there could be a challenge. 
mm. maybe, maybe not from the Republican Party. Um, but again, if, we're, if the stories are true, that the Democratic Party, even in North Dakota, um, is getting its act together, is motivated and uh, coming on strong, then that's the sort of election where you would um, expect a Democrat to be competitive. Again, maybe not win, but you know, at least show uh, the flag, show that they can actually uh, compete and provide an alternative rather than, well, there's this Republican that we're used to versus this Democrat who I've never heard of and seems to be, well, I don't know anything about him. So, I mean, again, you know, it seems like I'm, uh, I'm grading the Democrats with low standards in North Dakota to be just competitive. But unfortunately, if you're the Democrats, um, that's sort of a step up. It hasn't been a good uh, last few years for the statewide party. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the governor, and uh, so how would you uh, rank Governor Burgum in, in his early years, governors? Well, it's still early, and uh, as we get into a new uh, legislative session where he's governor and has an agenda, um, what will be interesting to see is not just, well, whether he's, uh, uh, you know, people pay attention to what he's um, saying, but whether he can put meat to his um, rhetoric, because we hear a lot of stuff about, you know, um, uh, you know, redoing higher education, modernizing this and that, but we haven't really seen what that actually means in terms of policy, in terms of passing something through the legislature and such. Um, there are some uh, commissions going on, there are some um, groups that are getting together, and maybe they'll fill in the gaps, but that's sort of um, you know, uh, you know, Bergham seems to be a nice guy. He seems like, you know, people like him and such. Um, but, you know, to use the old commercial, where's the beef? What is it that he's actually wanting to pass specifically so that people can say, all right, if this passes, this is how it will impact higher education. If this passes, this will how it impact uh, the oil industry and such. And so that's what I think a lot of people are waiting for, is that we kind of are expecting a proactive governor, not somebody who's just going to say, well, things are going okay. I'm not going to rock the boat. Yeah. Considering what you just said, do you think Governor Burgum will gain traction in reinventing government and, of course, higher education and sort of putting his stamp on, it, on, it, on things in the state? I think so, even if he doesn't get me to it, because even if you don't do much, even if you just sort of plod on through with a lot of high-minded rhetoric, there's no other show in town. I mean, if, they, if he's going to be ineffectual, there's nobody who's going to jump in and say, I'm going to do this. If he's going to be very strong and get things done, well, the legislature can, of course, counterweight it, but there's not going to be necessarily um, anybody else who's going to be throwing it out there, like, well, we're going to redo the uh, university system. So he has opportunities. Um, it's just a question of whether he can translate into something meaningful or if it's just going to be sort of the same old, same old. Uh, you know, do you, do you think social media has had an impact on people in, in polarizing uh, political parties in, in the political arena? Uh, sometimes the theory is that people will be more rude and say things mm -hmm. on Facebook or uh, that they wouldn't say in person. I think there's something to that that people feel quite uh, okay being rude or passing on yeah. memes and articles that are quite, you know, outrageous and such. I think, you know, this has been observed for social media is that a lot of times it's a lot easier to cocoon with your own people who believe your own sort of viewpoints, whether it's politics, religion, culture, whatever, that, you know, uh, when you're on the internet and you see something you disagree with, the tendency is to say, you're wrong, I don't, you know, and you'll write it on somebody's guest or something like that and they, you know, kick you out and such. There's a tendency to sort of group up with people that you, that you know, you know their attitude and you like that your ideas are reinforced. So I think that's sort of the, the, the trend that we've seen. The other side of the coin, of course, is that um, uh, social media has uh, uses for politics in that you can get the message out very quickly. You know, with the uh, shootings in Florida, um, that message has been prolonged about we have to do something and pushed by uh, the use of social media. Nick, I'm sorry, we're out of time. I oh. wish we had. Where can people go to get more information? Well, I mean, my goodness. Um, I think the major thing to do if you're trying to get more information that you should try to uh, get a mix of information. You know, go with the Fargo Forum. Why not go with uh, public radio? Even if you don't like it, go with, you know, the right wing, you know, blogs and such. Because the real problem with um, uh, North Dakota is that we don't have enough voices. And I don't just mean that we, we don't think differently. It's just that, you know, a lot of states have half a dozen blogs. Nick. Thank you for joining us. Today. Well, thanks for having me. Stay tuned for more. Dave Thompson has been the news director at Prairie Public's radio service for longer than anyone can remember. He's a valued member of our team and an even more valuable news resource for listeners across North Dakota. Recently, KXMB Television in Bismarck did this profile on Dave. Well, here we are. And are we glad? 
Dave Thompson still remembers uttering those words, the first words ever delivered on North Dakota's public airwaves on September 1st, 1981. I was proud to say I was the first live voice on Prairie Public. If his voice sounds familiar, there's a good reason for that. Good morning for Prairie Public, I'm Dave Thompson. United Airlines will be He's still there, on your radio, delivering the news each morning. When I turn on my microphone, I often envision a friend or a relative being the face on the microphone, so I'm talking to a friend or relative. That's, that's what radio is, intimacy. A lot's changed in Dave's 36 years as a broadcaster. Computers have replaced typewriters, microphones can now fit in your pocket, and digital editing software has made Dave's job faster and, frankly, safer. We used to edit things using a razor blade and tape, and I've had a few scars that will show you that I did that. But for all those technological leaps, he says the experience of listening to the radio hasn't changed, and that's a good thing. Radio, you don't have a visual, so your mind gets a chance to hear what natural sound and how your mind paints a picture that might be very different, but it's yours. And I think that that's powerful. And in 2018, Dave Thompson is just as dedicated to what he calls driveway moments. When you get into your car and you just can't leave the car. You have to listen to the end of the story. As he was back in 1981. If we did that, when we've done our job well. A pioneer of public radio, Dave Thompson is someone you should know. For Prairie Public, I'm Dave Thompson at 822 Central, 722 Mountain. Tim Olson, KX News. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. But as always, thanks for watching. Funding provided by the members of Prairie Public.